Hello, welcome aboard Freedom, and welcome to Misty and Me. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a different kind of vlog for me. I don't normally do pieces directly to camera as such, um, but I want to answer um, a lot of the questions that we've been asked both via the YouTube channel, through our group page on Facebook, and such as Instagram. Um, so what I've done, I've made a list of the questions regarding the costs, and it's all about the costs of uh, boat life. So uh, this whole vlog is going to be dedicated to answering them questions uh, in the context of living on a wide beam. Um, I'm not going to even uh, attempt to give our advice on costings for a narrow boat because I have no experience of living on a narrow boat, and there is plenty of good YouTube channels out there that's already covered this subject. Um, and I know that um, Mark on We're On The Move um, have done a piece on their costings, but there's that's for a couple living on a boat, so there's only me and Misty, so I thought I'd just do one as a single uh, occupant. And let me just say right from the beginning, these is the costings are based on our lifestyle. We have a, a very comfortable lifestyle, a very warm boat, and we eat well. So obviously everybody's different um, and you will reflect that in your prices that you'll be paying for that lifestyle that you're going to live. So the very very first question I want to cover and it's one that comes up quite a lot is how expensive was it um, to buy freedom? And the honest answer is for me it wasn't expensive. In fact, um, I was pleasantly surprised that I bought this boat um, £50,000 under my boat budget. I had looked at countless boats and I didn't want to buy a brand new one because I felt that depreciation was a major factor. And you hear so many um, reports by the forums that sometimes when people have had a boat built, it doesn't conform to their expectations or there's been issues with customer care or workmanship etc and I felt more comfortable buying a boat that won't depreciate as rapidly and has been around long enough that all the niggles for want of a better word will have been sorted. Now Freedom was um, a shell built in 2009 fitted out over two years by the original owners who I bought her from and Jeff and Lee have kept this boat absolutely beautiful. I believe Jeff was um, a carpenter by trade, so he did all the fit out and the whole design and everything was theirs and it was all put together under the guidance of a marine architect. So it's all been put together properly and I'm very lucky to have, have bought um, a beautiful boat for not a lot of money. Now I had been and looked um, as most people do at other boats in marinas, on brokerages, on Apollo Duck um, and I had a list in my head of what I wanted and I wanted a 65 foot boat, I wanted two bedrooms, I wanted double glazing, I wanted a pump out toilet, I wanted a stern galley and I wanted wheel steering. Freedom is a 57 foot boat, she only has one bedroom she hasn't got double glazing, she hasn't got a stern galley, and she has a tiller. But she's perfect, absolutely perfect. Because one of the things you need to consider, I suppose, more so with a wide beam than an arrow, is what, what do you actually want from the boat, and where do you actually want to go? And I was strongly advised against buying the 65 foot that I'd, I'd almost committed to buy, by a good friend of mine who has a similar size boat to this, well it's the same size but it's just an older boat, and he advised me to go for 57 by 12, which is exactly what Freedom is, because my intentions is eventually to sail this boat with Misty all the way to Liverpool and back, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if the boat was 65 foot long. Um, <coughs> so yes, I looked at a lot of boats that met the, the criteria that I wanted, and price wise some were um these were all second hand 
was ranging from 150,000 down into double thousand figures. Um, now, I'm not going to tell you what I paid for freedom because that wouldn't be fair on Jeff and his wife because they were very, very generous with me when I bought this boat. And I will forever uh, be thankful for that. It means that I've got a nice lifestyle and an affordable lifestyle. But my advice to you is make sure that you are prepared to compromise. Don't walk away from the perfect boat simply because it doesn't tick every box, box on your list. Um, one of my friends said, why did you want two bedrooms? And the answer was, well, when the family come to stop. Now, he's lived on his boat for over 30 years. And he says, you put them on the sofa. He says, because they'll all say they're going to come every weekend, and they don't. He says, and they'll be quite happy to put a sleeping bag on the sofa, job done. And you pay more for a two-bedroom boat. You've got more length, or... If you've got a two bedroom 57 foot boat, you're going to compromise on the size of your saloon and galley area. And Freedom is a one bedroom boat with a bathroom with shower system in there, a galley, and obviously the saloon. And she's a beautiful warm boat, and I couldn't wish for better. So do be prepared to compromise. Do your homework. Do join the forums and take advice because there's lots of advice available out there on different makers. Um, especially if you're going to have a brand new boat built, it's worth looking into in a lot more depth because you are going to be talking anything from 150,000 to 200,000 plus, and it needs to be a quality boat if you're paying that kind of money. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there will be people who will be able to guide you better than me. So, welcome aboard Freedom. I'm now going to move on to the next one in the questions. Okay, so you've bought a boat. So the next thing is, where are you going to keep it? Um, you've got several options. Some people um, buy a boat, not like myself, I've bought a boat to live on. Some have them as a leisure boat, so they'll go out weekends whenever they can and you'll take a leisure mooring um, I've got a residential mooring here at Mercia you may decide that you want to constantly cruise um, the waterways of the UK um, so you won't have mooring fees there are um, pontoons etc around the system and areas on the system where you'll be able to tie up um, anything from a 48 hours up to some of the 14 days but you do have to move after 14 days so you can't just untie and move up a boat length you have to move the average the average is like a mile two miles out of that area and then again next set of moorings you could moor up again but you have to move again after two weeks so there's no cost there um i have a cost and if you're buying a wide beam do be prepared because that is to me is the most expensive part of living on the boat at the moment um, because you are going to pay in a marina the price of two narrow boats because you're going to take up a double mooring uh, where the marina would normally put a narrow boat next to another narrow boat and take the money for two you are going to more or less fill that mooring so they will still expect that same payment so that can be a bit expensive but again shop around because I chose to live at Mercy Marina because I think it's the most beautiful marina around. I have looked at others in the area, and to be honest, the moorings are half the price. Um, but I chose to live the lifestyle that I live here at Mercy, and I'm happy with that payment. Now, you can go on the website, and you'll see exactly how the um, pricing structures work for each and every marina. And you basically pay your money, and take the choice uh, but do be prepared when you do your budgeting that the cost can vary dramatically as can the facilities that the marinas offer do make sure before you commit that you go to that marina 
ask the office to show you around, look at everything, look at the shower blocks, look at the toilet facilities, look at the laundry facilities. Um, yes, you may have a shower on your boat, and yes, you may have a laundry, uh, a washing machine on your boat, um, but if you've got them on the marina, it's, you know, it's, it's worth making sure that they're to a standard that if you do need to use them, that you're happy using them. And uh, as I say, do your homework, talk to people who live on that marina and take their advice as to what uh, you're going to get for your money. Shop around, that's my advice. Be prepared to pay a little bit extra if you want a nice marina because you will have to pay. Now, one of the other uh, more substantial expenses of owning a boat and living on a boat will be your boat license. Uh, for freedom, I'm paying as near as damn thousand pounds a year, which is nineteen pounds a week. Uh, and again, this varies um, on which rivers, certain rivers you've got to have a separate license for. Uh, but this is basically so you can have your boat floating on uh, Canal and River Trough waterway, and. Uh, is something you can't avoid you've got to pay it um, so again budget that into your weekly expenditure uh, for me again the 19 pounds isn't a isn't a major issue then it's a um, it's like when you have to I don't know tax your car insure your car etc it's one of those ongoing regular costs that you've just got to allow for right insurance well that is something you really do need to look into I was pleasantly surprised um, when I came to Ensure Freedom, I searched the web and took advantage of all the information that was given out by the um, Y-Beam and, and the Narrowboat forums on to who to approach to get Freedom insured. And uh, it's like the car insurance. You really do need to shop around because the prices can be very, very high. <laughs> And some seem to be very, very cheap. Um, and I must confess that, um, again, I took advice from other boaters, found an insurance company, and for freedom, uh, she's fully comped insured for contents, every eventuality, I think, other than a UFO falling out the sky on top of her. Um, it's £310. Let me just check them to tell you the truth. Yes, £310. Uh, it's my fully comp insurance for the year, which is actually less than I pay to insure my van fully comp for the year. Uh, it's about £5.90 a week is my insurance. Now, make sure you look at the small print when you take out boat insurance. Most of them will cover uh, most eventualities and most situations, but any what I call expensive items, you know, luckily I don't own a Rolex watch or anything of that kind of nature, they will ask you to take insurance out on them separately. Um, but the most important thing is you're covering the, the, the big expensive thing, which is obviously the boat itself uh, and any damage that you could cause to another boat while you're out on the waterway. So for me, pleasantly surprised, £310. I'm not going to argue with that. I just thought that was a good price. Electricity. Now, in the marina, I'm plugged into the mains. Now, that feeds into the electric cupboard here where I have a, um, what I always call them an intelligent charger. It's a battery charger that constantly keeps your batteries topped up, but doesn't overcharge. Uh, all the lighting in the boat is 12 volt, um, as is the, the lights at the side of me, they're 12 volt. Uh, but I do run um, mains electric for the um, television, my fridge freezer my toaster, my microwave, my DVD player, and uh, what else have I got? Oh, a kettle. I'm a kettle. Now these are all 
230 volt, uh, 240 volts, uh, so mains electric. Now, again, I'm really surprised at how cheap this is for us on this boat. We have a card system at the marina where you go into the office and you pay onto your card and your card is like a plastic credit card that when you get back to your pontoon you go to the stanchion point and you push it in and it feeds into your meter. Now I've lived on Freedom almost a year now and it was a bit of a guess when I first lived on board because I had no idea what I was going to be using. and. To be fair, I've worked it out over the almost a year now. I'm spending less than £4.50 a week on electricity. I always put £20 um, on payday onto my meter and I'm always in credit at the end of the month when I run into the next month. And that's across the board. This is obviously allowing for spring, summer, autumn and now obviously we're in the winter. I moved on board in the March, on March the 21st, just before the first lockdown. And I also have an immersion heat, I meant, I, meant, I meant to mention that, which runs a couple of hours every night, so I've got plenty of hot water for shower, etc. And I just think it works out at 60 some pence a day, which is, I'll tell you exactly, it's 64 pence a day for my electricity. Uh, and to me, I think that's damn good value. Now, once you're out on the water, then you're going to be relying on your batteries. Now, I've got, a, as I say, a battery charger that's charging my leisure batteries permanently so that when I come on the boat at night and I put all my lighting on, that's drawn from the batteries. So that trickle charge is obviously on my mains electric. Now, I do intend when I go out on the water to fit solar because I've got a massive roof, lots of space, and I will need them batteries topped up. So I can charge them in several ways. I'm putting a travel pack on the engine so that when I'm actually cruising, uh, that will charge the batteries. But I'm also going to have the facility of having uh, solar as well. So again, for me, living in a marina, the electricity isn't expensive. But I suppose, again, it depends on your lifestyle and I'll always come back to that you know um, I can only tell you how the, the costs are affecting me and Misty as we live now so gas now on board freedom we carry two times the 13 kilo gas bottles in the locker on the front of the bow, on the bow, um, which is there for my cooker and hob. They are both gas. I also have an Alde gas central heating boiler on board, which is um, plumbed into a cupboard in the actual bedroom, but I don't use that. Uh, not at the moment. Uh, I rely on the uh, immersion heater which is in with my electric bill as I've already discussed and I have a back boiler that takes the uh, hot water from the back boiler into the uh, water tank and the element in there helps to heat the water so it's not stone cold so when I put the immersion on it literally is only a 15-20 minutes to get the tank really hot the, um, the gas central heating system I've been advised will eat the gas crazy um, but again, it's just nice to have it on board. So if I'm out on the water and for whatever reason I've got issues, I've got backup for heating uh, and hot water. So I've so far replaced the bottles twice since I've been on board. And that cost was the last bottle I bought cost me £28, has lasted five months which is uh, one pound, forgive me, one pound 40 a week. And I cook, I wouldn't say every day, but I would say six days out of seven I'm cooking. And on the, on the days um, when I am cooking, I'm also baking. So I try and utilize the fact that I've got the oven on. So if I'm cooking my dinner, 
I will make some bread or I'll make some shortbread or whatever sausage rolls and make use of the fact that the oven's on. But £1.40 a week for gas, uh, again, not expensive. Now you will be able to buy gas out on the waterways from the fuel boats, I don't know what they charge. Um, but budget yourself to be looking on average four to five months per bottle, depending on how many people's on board and obviously what your, your usage level is going to be. But again, gas, definitely not expensive. <clears throat> coal now freedom is fitted with a more so squirrel multi-fuel stove which burns smokeless fuel and hardwood logs and again since i moved on board because i knew that i was going to at some point do this um youtube channel i wanted to be able to give honest figures you know not guessomics i wanted to be able to tell it as it is now I was fortunate before I moved on board, I bought uh, a ton of smokeless fuel, which cost me nine pounds for a 25 kilo bag. Now, you can pay anything up to 14, 15 pounds for a 25 kilo bag. And there's a whole range of different smokeless fuels out there suitable. Um, and it really is a case of experimenting to see which is the ones that work best for you. Because even though I've got a morso squirrel and you've got a morso squirrel, they both both don't burn as efficiently, and I don't know why. Uh, whether it's down to the length of your chimney, the type of diameter of your stack, I don't know. But I've, I've spoke to so many different boaters who say to me, "Oh, my boat doesn't like that, and my morso squirrel doesn't like that." And it's true. It is true. I've tried different fuels. Now, I was fortunate because I had space to store. 40 bags at work so i would bring a few bags each time i wanted someone for the boat and again being a wide beam i've got the space on the stern and on the bow to keep half a dozen bags on each end keeps it balanced out and i'm not lugging coal every day every week when it comes down to the usage obviously again the figures i'm going to give you is based on moving on on the 21st of march up to now which is beginning of february so i've done the spring i've done the summer i've done the autumn and i'm well into the winter and yes i am using more coal now in the winter which you'd expect and in the summer um i don't have the stove on and uh, so obviously it works out swings and roundabouts at the moment i'm using two bags of coal per week and a bag of logs. Now, um, I buy my coal at the moment at £10 a bag because I'm not buying it by the ton, it'll always come cheaper if you buy it by the ton. I'm buying it £10 a bag and two bags last me a week. My logs, I shop around for logs, there's plenty of deals to be had on such as Facebook Marketplace with people selling uh seasoned as long as you get seasoned wood that's what you need uh, and there's also a lot of people advertising um free off cuts now off cuts often are places that uh, are manufacturing sheds etc and they're trimming boards down um to make them into the shed sizes that they want and they could be four inch five inch six inch sections left now this is clean pine wood it's not been treated at that point um it's got no preservatives on it and it does burn quicker than hardwood and obviously you will get a lot of ash but it's free you know you've just got to go and fetch it and you'd be you'd be surprised how many bargains there is i'm paying at the moment on average two pounds for a potato sack a large potato sack of logs and that'll keep me going for a week it, well over a week but we always say a week so yes, two bags of coal, £20 in the winter, uh, and a bag of logs is £2. So it's like £3 a day to run the system 24 hours. So that is, to me, is good going. Um, but on average, just if I'm letting a note down here, on average, across the year, I'm burning one and a half bags of coal. 
across the year. I don't use logs during the summer and the, and the, and the autumn and the spring. I haven't needed to. Um, so one pound fifty. Uh, that works out per was it fifteen pounds a week? So that's two pounds something a day, and uh, really good economy. There is a lot of people now moving towards diesel stoves, uh, but the more people I've talked to run diesel, yes, it's clean. Um, I personally wouldn't want diesel uh, because I want I want to see a fire, and I grew up in the fifties, so I'm used to an open fire. And I don't, I honestly don't feel that there's a lot of dust and mess. People say there is. Um, I'm very house proud on board freedom. I'm not, I'm not dusting up lots of dust and mess. I wipe the hearth down every day. Yes, that can get a little bit dirty when you're putting stuff in and out of the fire, but the size of the worktops, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing this dust and dirt that some people say they're getting. So, coal fire for me all day long. It's cosy, it's warm. Sometimes it's a little bit too warm and I end up taking the porthole glasses out because I've thrown an extra log on maybe more than I should have done. Um, but it heats the whole of my boat to a standard where I don't need to put the central heating on. And this is 57 foot by 12 foot wide. So uh, I think that's good value for money. So for me, it's cold, cold, cold. Food. How much do I spend on food? Well, I shop on a Sunday and I only have to shop for myself and Misty. And this includes, my, my food bill includes buying Misty's food as well. Um, I don't eat takeaways. I used to when I lived in the house, I would happy eat pizzas, etc. I tend to cook most of my meals that I have on board freedom, I cook. Uh, so I, I eat healthily, I eat, I eat very, very well. Uh, anybody who's followed me on my um, Facebook page will have seen the pictures of dinners that I do, and uh, I don't skimp, I don't skimp, and I don't eat rubbish. Now, on average, across the year, my weekly shopping bill has been £35. Now, some weeks it's less, some weeks it's a little bit more, but it floats on average around £35. Which, considering I eat a cooked dinner every day and breakfast, and I've got a dog and she eats well, I think that's pretty good going. And I will, throughout the channel, be doing, uh, and I already have done some very cost effective meals. Uh, not because uh, money's tight. Uh, I'm lucky in that respect that I can afford to um, eat what I want. Uh, but as I said before, I grew up in the 50s um, when we on a farm in the middle of nowhere and we only ever got to eat what my dad would shoot with a shotgun. And that's how it was in them days. And uh, one of the things that I learned is, as I was a chef for uh, many, many years when I left school, is that you can make some beautiful dishes using cuts of meat that people tend not to use nowadays so much uh, for very little money and uh, that reflects in my food bill and I think £35 a week and that includes everything that's not just the food that I buy it's cleaning products uh, as well you know for the shower and for the kitchen and uh, dog food for my dog so uh, not an expensive bill um, so again, another cost that can be controlled depending on the lifestyle that you're going to choose to live when you move on to your boat. Laundry. Now, that's a good one. I, my boat fitted with a washing machine, um, but here at Mercia we have fantastic laundry blocks in fact they've just all been fitted out with uh, brand new commercial washer and dryer machines separate machines and by commercial i mean they will take one heck of a lot of a load of laundry uh, more so than your normal household washing machine i've worked it out that across a month 
Um, because I'll be honest, there's some weeks when I don't do laundry because there isn't enough to do, you know. There's only many, only so many socks and pants you can get through. Um, but I obviously do all my bedding, my cushion covers, my throws that I put on the sofa for Misty. And I pay a month in the, in the laundry, in the laundry here, £15 for a month. So I think that works out about 50 pence per day on average. Um, and that includes um, my washing um, soaps, etc., and conditioners. Um, so £15 a month, I think, is very, very good value. And that includes using the dryers in there because, again, you've got separate dryers. And I like the fact that we're doing it all on land. I know we're going to be doing it on the boat when I go constant cruising, as many people have to. But the nice thing about using the laundrette on site is all that damp from drying clothes isn't in your boat. It's been put through the commercial dryer and the damp air is blown out into the atmosphere and when you get your laundry back on the boat it's bone dry, ready for ironing and you're not bringing moisture, unnecessary moisture into your boat. So yeah, my laundry, £15 per month, um, damn good value for money, I think so. Every every marina will offer some kind of um, laundry facility, some are better than others. Uh, I know at Sawley Marina they give the uh, residential moorers um, tokens um, and I did ask when I went to look at Sawley Marina how many tokens you got and the answer was just enough. So I'm not quite sure how they work that one out but they don't charge you there whereas here the machines again like your electricity you have a what looks like a credit card you go in the office you put your £15 a month on your card Every time you put it in the machine, it tells you how much is on the card. And once you've used the card, it will tell you how much is remaining. So you keep an eye on it. It saves you having to carry cash. Toilet costs. Now, as I said right at the beginning, I wanted a pump out toilet on the boat. And when I found out that Freedom had got a cassette toilet, I was a bit disheartened. But you'll have seen the vlogs that I've done. If you haven't, do go back and have a look. Um, I'm so happy that it has. Uh, it's so easy. It's not an issue. Uh, and as I say to everybody, emptying a cassette toilet, to me, is a walk in the park. In fact, it's less of an issue than picking up one of Misty's poos. Uh, I've never yet gone in and emptied a... Um, cassette and thought oh, you know it's how you treat uh, your cassette before you use it I suppose has a lot to do with that mm -hmm. I buy um, the toilet blue from the marina I'll try and put a picture on of the cassette with one of the bottles and um, mm -hmm. the last deal that they did I had two five litre bottles which I think cost me at the time 22 pounds for the pair 11 pounds a bottle and uh, every time you empty and rinse the cassette out, you put a measure of this toilet blue into the cassette with a little drop of clean water, and that just breaks down all the um, solids, etc., and it eliminates um, smells from your toilet. I've never once come on this boat and thought, oh my God, I must have a cassette toilet on board, uh, and I've never emptied it and thought, oh, I wish I hadn't got a cassette toilet. And it works out mm -hmm. at the moment, again, not quite a year yet, but I'm almost on a year, mm -hmm. and it's working out approximately 50 pence per week mm -hmm. because I need to empty my cassette, because I'm single on the boat, obviously. I need to empty my cassette once mm -hmm. a week, and I treat it with a full measure, and uh, mm -hmm. it works out at 50 pence. So it's not an expensive item. And obviously the L sum point is for free, as it will be on the um, item on the cut. Once you've got your CRT keys and that, you can get into the facilities and use the L signs. Now, I am aware that the L sum points around the waterway system will not all be to the standard that we have here at Mercia. 
cars are spotlessly clean. Um, you don't mm. walk in holding your nose. It's not that kind of setup. And um, it's very, very user friendly. And uh, yeah, 50p. Not bad, is it? Do I have a boat fund? Well, that's a good question. Well, the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. From the moment I moved on board Freedom, I decided to set up an account into which I pay every week uh, part of my wages as my boat fund account. Now, at the moment, I haven't used that account for anything because living as I am at the moment on the marina, nothing needs replacing, thankfully, the pumps and etc. are working great and uh, my batteries are fine. But the whole point of having a boat fund is what happens if whilst everything is working lovely, the temptation is to spend your money on other things. My advice to anybody taking up living on a boat is create a boat fund. Put yourself a set amount in that every week, whether it's 20, 30 pounds or 100 pounds, whatever you can afford. Because the way I look at it is, at the end of the year, if you haven't used it, then you can either let it roll into the following year and keep building up. And it's there then for when you need to get the boat blacked, which in the case of Freedom will need to be done in another couple of years time. Um, whether you need to buy batteries, which can, depending on the style of battery you buy, whether you're buying um, a standard wet battery, as I would call it, or a gel battery or a lithium battery. Mm -hmm. Lithium batteries can be so expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And you had to buy three or four at a time, then you're talking mm -hmm. into thousands of pounds worth of expenditure. Mm -hmm. So I always had that worry, what happens if? Now I know I've got an engine that's done no mileage, or 19 hours is to say on a boat because you don't have a milometer. Mm -hmm. It's like a tractor, they do it by how many hours the engine's been running. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know my more so squirrel is almost new mm -hmm. and, and everything at the moment is working good. But I wanted to be sure that mm -hmm. if I have a situation arise that I'm not panicking to pay for it. And I would advise everybody, no matter what amount you can afford, put something away every week. Now there is a, uh, a boating average that goes around that says boat stands for bring out another thousand. Because whenever you spend money on a boat, you'll be spending big money. Now, yeah, I, I can agree with that if you're going to have your boat painted by a boat yard and um, or you have to buy an engine, obviously, if your engine blew up. But again, preventive maintenance is always a good thing. Make sure you keep on top of everything. Uh, service your engines regularly. Use good quality filters, good quality oil. Same with your central heating systems. Make sure that you run the proper antifreeze in the, in the system to keep the, um, the rust at bay so you're not going to get a problem eating pumps because they're filling up with rubbish and uh, keep that safety net there because the day will come and I, and I know that that something on this boat's going to go suddenly wrong and then I go that's what the boat funds for and then it doesn't come as a shock put a bit away just in case um, so it's a good insurance policy and if after five six seven years of living on a boat you've only eaten into that boat fund a little bit then you can always look at it as a, an add-on to your pension because it's sitting there accumulating and obviously you've got the peace of mind of knowing that you're budgeting just in case something does suddenly come out of the blue and hit you and it's an expensive item that you're going to need. So basically to sum everything up, living on a boat for me is very affordable it's definitely a lot cheaper than living in the house that i came out of uh, yes it was a big house and a big house has big bills um i was heating six bedrooms 
and I lived in, or we used one. Um, I had a lounge and dining room that was as big as, as the boat I live on now, and very rarely did I use the dining area. And when you look back, one of the one of the things that you find is once you've psychologically got your head around downsizing, it's amazing how little you actually do need. And uh, as I said right at the beginning, I've got a well insulated boat that keeps me lovely and warm. I don't cut back on anything. The figures I've given you are accurate figures up to today in February. Uh, so it's almost a year. And uh, hopefully it gives you a bit of an insight of life on a wide beam, as in the costs. Now, if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Please remember these are my costings and my lifestyle. And you've got to allow a little bit of give and take, um, depending how you see your future on your boat. Um, but I hope it's helped you. And thank you so much for watching. Covered a lot of things. And I'm now going to go and put the kettle on, have a cup of tea, and a bit of shortbread. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. And uh, give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Bye-bye. Mm.